Okay, thank you, Johnny. Um, after the lively debate before, <coughs> and particularly after uh, Eddie Fang's talk this morning, I don't think high flow will disappear. It will be part of our treatment. Uh, I think the discussion in future will be more about where and when, and right choice. So the first part of my talk will be a fairly quick going through where it's currently used, where the evidence is, but then I'm going, there's much more to it. And uh, I just want to seed some ideas. I'm not going to say this is what's going to happen, but I just want to uh, make you thinking a little bit more about uh, you know, where we're going. So as I said before, the definitions are very important that we talk about high flow uh, to me, there's no ceiling to how much flow, despite people saying there is a risk involved. And of course, there's a risk with any treatment involved. Pneumothoraces have been described. Uh, but I'm strongly arguing that we need uh, as much as possible flow to match the inspiratory demand. Max Klein quite nicely showed if he insufflated in upper airway obstruction, by the way, in 1986, so first high flow described in Cape Town, and he measured esophagus pressures, and when uh, he stopped the high flow, that's where the red arrows are, that's uh, esophagus pressure. You can see that the uh, so-called negative pressure swings in the esophagus became much larger, so the work of breathing went up. Uh, and I showed this as well. I think hopefully it's going quite well. That's an upper airway of a child with upper airway obstruction, uh, swollen airways on high flow, and then we switched the high flow off. And you can quite nicely see how the high flow uh, distends the upper airway. And now we're starting the high flow again. And you can again see how the upper airway quite nicely reinflates. And that's just the distending pressure of the high flow that helps to stabilize the airway. And it's quite commonly seen in upper airway obstruction. The next uh, question that we need to address is the work of breathing. And that's what we've uh, done in um, a few trials. I'm just showing one slide on it. Uh, we had bronchiolitic infants and cardiac infants off high flow, on high flow, and these numbers, they're just the surrogate number for the work of breathing, and you can see the number drops when they're on high flow, but even in the healthy cardiac lungs, or these are just kids, they are about to be discharged to the ward, you can see that the work of breathing quite significantly reduces. And the reason is very simple. We push, if we give enough high flow, we push air into the lung. The inspiratory phase is the only active phase of the respiratory cycle. The expiration is passive. As you can see, Milesi showed here the uh, nasopharyngeal pressure. Upper line is during the expiration, on the, the lower line is during the inspiration. And you can see when he increases the flow rate between one and seven liters in these four kilogram babies, at some point the pressures are starting to become positive during the inspiratory phase. Normally, if we inhale, we have negative pressure inside the nasopharynx. If we deliver enough high flow, this pressure becomes positive. If we don't deliver enough high flow, we have to entrain air around the nasal cannulas to basically have enough inspiratory flow. Uh, so if we don't adjust the flow to the demand of the patient, the patient has to entrain air around the nasal cannula in addition to what the high flow delivers. You don't deliver any more the oxygen fraction that you actually have dialed up on your machine. So I took this into a human experiment underwater, and I put myself on 60 liters of high flow and spent there 10 minutes breathing underwater. I flushed my upper airways. I had a CPAP effect of a few centimeters of water, and I didn't aspirate. I'm still here. I'm still alive. Uh, and that's how high flow should be delivered. So, uh, in my view, high flow give enough to match the inspiratory demand to actually support the breathing, and I've been there uh, comfortably for 10 minutes on the water. Then again, like I mentioned before, there's a role for high flow outside ICU, but it's not high flow versus non-invasive ventilation. Choose your patient, choose the right patients, and that's where we need to do more research. And as Ira mentioned before, uh, there is the danger that if we don't stop high flow, we may actually keep these patients longer in, uh, in the hospital, particularly if we just start everyone on high flow, we may unnecessarily treat uh, patients that are completely fine on standard oxygen therapy. 
So if you look a little bit about the history of high flow, we uh, decreased our intubation rate from one third to uh, three, five percent uh, in Australia. Uh, so in Australia, you find roughly less than 10 percent of the patients uh, currently intubated and ventilated with bronchiolitis. I'm not sure if that's only high flow. It's probably as well as intensivists realizing that ventilation is bad for bronchiolitis. There may be other factors uh, involved. But just for the cause of high flow, I blame high flow for it, but I'm pretty sure this is uh, sort of a little bit fake news uh, or opinion. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily fully subscribe to it. Uh, but we know from the UK, uh, the bronchiolitis admissions are going up, air pollution, more viral infections, more burden on the healthcare system. But quite interestingly, in Australia, we have shown for a particularly uh, some children that we still use too much uh, invasive ventilation and some units still use uh, intubation and ventilation as almost uh, the standard respiratory support system in ICU. Uh, this is a worry because if you measure the neurological outcome of these previously completely healthy children, you can measure three months post uh, discharge, you can measure neuro impairment and probably the neuro impairment that you can measure is due to the sedation that we use during mechanical ventilation. So this is a very some uh, trend if you opt for mechanical ventilation. So I have the view that if you can avoid mechanical ventilation, you should do so. I showed that before that in this uh, database analysis that high flow can reduce uh, mechanical ventilation. I think we need randomized control trials to really prove this case. This is just database uh, data. And this is just data that supports that uh, potentially non-invasive ventilation is an isolated risk factor for intubation. But that's, again, opinion. I'm not entirely sure if a randomized control trial will support that. As Ira showed before, there's some doubts about uh, the validity of this data. So that leads us to the Paris trial. Look, I'm not going too much into our uh, recent bronchiolitis trial. Please read the paper, make your opinion. I can just tell you, uh, don't publish such a trial because the letters that you get, uh, they are from very nice to very nasty uh, and very hard to answer sometimes. Uh, so we had a quite, quite interesting conversation with uh, some of uh, the people who had very different opinions of what we do. Nevertheless, uh, this trial probably created more questions than answers. Uh, we uh, uh, measured basically the proportion of Escalation need uh, of high flow patients versus standard oxygen. Looked at safety and quality outside intensive care. And we could obviously demonstrate high flow has a reduced requirement to escalate therapy. Uh, as I showed before, uh, just being in a trial uh, is uh, fantastic because the so-called so low intubation rate within a trial makes it worthwhile to enroll every patient into a trial uh, be it high flow or anything else, I think we should have for all our ICU patients or for all of our hospital patients a trial assigned to them according to their disease. Uh, I per se, being part of research makes outcome just better. Now, people ask us what's happening with the older patients. So that's Paris 2 trial. So these are the older kids uh, with not bronchiolitis. Uh, so we, in this trial, needed to find out uh, the definition of disease because bronchiolitis is quite a nice, neat disease to study. Whereas when they uh, present in an older age group, we have reactive airways, we have pneumonias, chest, viral chest infection, etc. We have different age groups, we have different settings, etc. So we needed to do a pilot study. I'm showing you very quickly some data on a pilot. Uh, a pilot, by the way, which uh, enrolled 600 patients within six months. Uh, you can see it was quite a good effort uh, of the Royal Children's uh, Hospital in Melbourne and our hospital in Brisbane. Uh, we enrolled uh, between zero and uh, 16 years, minus uh, obviously bronchiolitis, uh, roughly uh, 300 um, uh, attributed in each uh, intervention arm. Uh, what's most important is, and what we learned from this pilot trial is, uh, don't do the zero to one, they're all bronchiolitis, so you're hardly going to find anything else than bronchiolitis between zero and one, so forget it. Uh, majority between one and five years of age, 
And then between 5 and 16, you have all different diseases, chronic, neuromuscular, CF, etc. Uh, and we decided it's too hard in a future randomized control trial to investigate them. So we are going now to tackle between 1 and 5 years of age. However, already in this pilot trial, we did find a difference in the need to escalate between standard oxygen versus uh, high flow. Not necessarily similarly distributed in age group. There may be a signal. Uh, so we are currently uh, running, again, a larger 1,500 uh, uh, patient trial. Importantly, within this pilot trial, we had zero complication. We had zero intubation. So, Imagine these are kids, they're coming into hospital with an oxygen requirement and you admit them because they're not unwell. So they're not, you know, your average admission uh, just to the hospital. And we had zero intubation uh, and zero complication in 600 patients. That doesn't mean, you know, we can confirm the data, but 600 patients with that low complication rate, that low intubation rate is quite impressive. Now, I'm pledging here for uh, another trial that we like to do, and it's in planning, is the post-extubation. You know, like Ira said, in our cardiac ICU, you say, please don't put the patient after extubation on high flow. You turn away, drink a coffee, and the patient is on high flow. So it's a plague. So we suggest to eliminate this nonsense, the following, that we say we decide to extubate, we have a high-risk group. The high-risk group is the clinician thinks this patient needs respiratory support post-extubation. So you have a decision made prior, I need non-invasive ventilation or any form of respiratory support. And we have a little bit other definitions around it. Or we say, no, maybe not. And then we randomize them in the high-risk group to non-invasive ventilation or high flow. In the low-risk group, standard oxygen versus high flow. And then we have, obviously, the escalation in both arms, intubation, or in the low risk to non-invasive ventilation, and then followed by intubation. And the outcome would be twofold to be decided, intubation or reintubation re rates, or length of stay is probably a more relevant outcome as the reintubation rates, at least in our setting, is quite low. But that's a trial design that we are now trying to find partners to perform. Quite easy to be performed because all the data is basically normally in your data set um, and not hard to collect. And we just want to find out, are they getting intubated and how long do they stay in ICU? And I think with a, such a simple pragmatic design where you ask the clinician, do you think your patient needs respiratory support post-extubation? That's when you start deciding if you should use uh, standard uh, high flow versus non-invasive ventilation. Now, there's a little bit more to high flow than what I just told you, and that's where I start to be excited. Um, adults, they've done high flow on adults at, uh, whilst they were asleep. Uh, concentrate around the red uh, rectangle. The up, uh, upper panel shows them off high flow, breathing fast or normal. Lower panel shows them on 45 liters. Respiratory rate comes down, tidal volume goes up. And if you look again, the respiratory rate in some of these patients drop down to two or three per minute. Now you're going away and try for 10 minutes to breathe at a rate of two or three, you're not gonna achieve it. You're gonna almost suffocate and you're gonna struggle. So there is something else that helps to contribute to the gas exchange than just the tidal breathing. And Anil Patel from London has described that a while ago by using high flow rates in adults during anesthesia when he has them paralyzed to establish a difficult airway by placing the endotracheal tube. And as you can see on the x-axis, these are the minutes that it took him in these apneic patients to insert the endotracheal tube. On the y-axis is just a gradual increase in CO2, but the saturations in these patients never dropped. So you see 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and the most was 61 minutes, and the current world record, or published world record, is 201 minutes of apneic time. That means no ventilation. Don't ask me about the CO2, obviously. Uh, but uh, it's quite uh, impressive. I mean, there's a lot of research going on. How does that gas exchange actually occur? 
is quite fascinating. So that's what we are doing now. We are doing a randomized controlled trial in Australia and New Zealand where we use uh, this apneic oxygenation in emergency intubation. So that means children coming through the emergency department or in the intensive care, they're quite sick, they get uh, allocated to standard, uh, standard intubation or high flow intubation. And that's how it looks like. So this child is now paralyzed. I mean, that's a, a, not, not one of the, the cases, but that's a demonstration video. So this kid is now paralyzed, anesthetized, pre-oxygenated with bag mask ventilation. And now the high flow goes on. And as you can see, these high flow nasal prongs, they're nicely outside the operating field of the intubator. And as you can see, they're just uh, nicely taking their time. Now, whilst this kid is lying there, uh, paralyzed, I show you our so-called pilot uh, date of the randomized controlled trial where we took healthy subjects into theater, asked the parents, do you mind if you paraly paralyze your child? And then wait till the saturations drop to 90% and then we back them up again. Or alternatively, in the intervention arm, place them on high flow and then we wait again till the saturation drop. Uh, the Australian population is very grateful for research, so we had out of uh, the entire study only three declined consent for this, so that works quite well. And as you can see, the uh, green triangles are the so-called control. They didn't receive high flow. They're all desaturated. The little ones after roughly 100 seconds, the larger or the older one after two, three minutes. And as you can see, the blue circles are the high flow patients. Uh, and they uh, have no standard or confidence interval. And we had to stop in all of them the intervention because none of them desaturated and we had to stop the intervention after a reasonable time because the surgeon said, I want to do my surgery and you couldn't wait there for half an hour. So we stopped or, or achieved the primary outcome after double of the expected apnea time. And as you can see, none of these uh, patients in the intervention arm desaturated. Now these patients, healthy lungs, nicely pre-oxygenated, we can't necessarily compare them to the emergency intubation, sick lungs, etc. But it's quite an interesting phenomenon. So that's how it looks after two or three minutes of waiting. Uh, you then just go on and as you can demonstrate, this nasal high flow does not interfere at all with your operator or with what the operator is going to do. You can proceed after that uh, to your intubation and insert the endotracheal tube without any problem. So does it matter? The anesthetist will say, no, I don't care, I always get the tube in. But the tube or the attempt is difficult in emergency, in ICU, when the kids are sick, when you have an unknown difficult airway, when the operator is inexperienced. That's when it matters. If you can give a junior registrar five minutes of time to insert the endotracheal tube, then it matters. So every single attempt is associated with morbidity and mortality. So that's where our trial hopefully will help uh, to improve outcome. Now, you will have read about Thrive, that's the transnasal humidified uh, rapid insufflation ventila uh, ventilation exchange. Thrive is the definition of apneic oxygenation if you go into the literature. So if you go and read the literature, apneic oxygenation has the label of Thrive. Whereas we talk about nasal high flow in spontaneous breathing children. So intubation is Thrive, so what I've just talked before, high flow is in spontaneous ventilation. Now, how about ENT surgery? ENT surgery, when you do uh, upper airway surgery, the anesthetist wants to have the airway and the surgeon wants to have the airway. Both are battling for the same battlefield. The anesthetist needs to keep the patient spontaneously breathing to assess the dynamic of the upper airway and can't put an endotracheal tube in, and the surgeon wants to operate. So you see, they two fight for the same. So you need to have an anesthetized, or quite heavily anesthetized child, because you know, larynx surgery has a quite a strong reflex. 
and you can't intubate, and the surgeon needs to continue intubating. There's the balance all the time there. There's the balance of, I can't deliver PEEP. Doesn't happen. So in uh, ENT surgery, there's this danger of the patient becoming apneic, not breathing, hypoxic, and then surgery needs to be stopped. Endotracheal tube needs to go in, rebag, reoxygenate. So if we have sort of an instrument now that does bridge these silly periods of apnea, that the surgeon can continue doing the operation, and then you reduce your propofol infusion after a minute or two, the patient starts to breathe again. What fantastic approach would that be? So we're currently running as well a randomized controlled trial where we offer high flow or thrive. Now, I don't know what I should call it because there may be apneas and no apneas. Uh, so, but you see that there's no end to it uh, where the question is, and uh, it's more about the communication then between the surgeon and the anesthetist to have the, you know, the, the right timing correct in between. So this is the hamster trial currently going on in 530 uh, children uh, uh, with the aim to prevent rescue oxygenation during microlaryngoscopy. That's how it looks like. You can see uh, the blue CO2 trace gradually goes up. That's the propofol remifentanyl guilt during the uh, microlaryngoscopy on high flow. But you see the sets are remaining the same. And on uh, the uh, right-hand side is a control arm where this dump of uh, desaturation happens. And you need uh, rescue oxygenation and intervention. And the surgeon has to stop his uh, surgery. Now, how much are we with time? Just over. Just over, OK. I would have had a nice video as well uh, uh, to show, but I'll stop here uh, and ask you to thrive or not to thrive. It all depends on you. Thank you very much.